This is the Valentine tank. Now we've looked at it before, so we're not really, we haven't come in here at least to look at this particular tank. We're actually doing the tank chat about a Valentine DD, but it's not here. In fact, it's a privately owned one, which we'll be visiting for, at least we hope it'll be coming down for Tank Fest. And that's what we really want to see, but not having the correct Valentine here, we chose this one to represent all of them. Please remember to like, subscribe, or click the little notification bell if you don't want to miss out on these videos. And I'd just like to say thank you to all our patrons for making this possible. Please join them if you can. Now, there really isn't a lot of difference. All Valentines had more or less the same chassis with the same suspension, Carden's bright idea suspension, and with a General Motors engine in the back in the late one. And the only real difference between the DD and this one is that the DD obviously has the flotation screen, but it's a Mark 9, and therefore it has the larger or slightly enlarged turret. What they'd actually done was the Valentine was built with a two-man turret. And two men really wasn't the ideal. From the War Office's point of view, they thought you needed at least three men in a turret. So they um, built a few of them, Marks 3 and 5, I think, with three-man turrets in. They were slightly extended at the front and a little bit at the back but they had to fit the same turret ring as is on the tank itself. So it was still a bit cramped. And when they then upgunned it to put a six pounder in, which they did for the Mark IX, they had to get rid of a tank crewman again. So it went back to being a two man turret. It meant that the tank commander was now also the loader. So for that, period, he had to actually give up his task as a commander and go into the more humble role of a loader for the six-pounder gun, because he had a gunner in the turret with him. And that's all they had, the two men operated the town, of course, the driver and the front. But that's the, the basic difference. We're, we really need to see the Mark IX turret, which is slightly different to this one, and with a much longer gun. But we'll see that on the whatever visuals we have of the tank at tank fest, which is a very good start. You'll see exactly what's sort of involved. But, um, this will do for the moment. Now, the whole business of Valentine DDs is tied up with a number of places around the country where they were tested. For a start, the DD was the invention, if you like, of a chap called Nicholas Straussler. Straussler was a Hungarian by birth, but he'd come over and settled in England and worked for various people, including Vickers and a number of others, on defence-related designs. And he then designed the DD. And he'd done it by taking an ordinary tank, in the original case of Tetrarch, and fitting it with a flotation screen up the sides, around the front here, which made the thing into a sort of boat. That was a boat that floated almost under the water with just this canvas screen supporting it. Well, at the time, and this is early in the Second World War, the Valentine was seen as the next best tank in the world and was uh, therefore the one chosen to be made into an operational DD. They were Mark Fives with the two-pounder gun and the three-man turret, the Mark Nines, with the same turret, but only with a, two men in it. And later, the Marks 10 and 11, especially the 11, which had the 75 millimeter gun, which is in fact the same thing as a six pounder, but uh, had the advantage of being a dual operated gun, capable of firing armor piercing and um, close support shells quite, quite well from the same gun, which was something we needed with all our tanks. But that was the first one that was capable of it. But this one with the six pounder, the six pounder was quite a good anti-tank gun. And it meant that um, at least it had a fair amount of whack. Now the DD tanks, when they were first designed, 
One of the problems with them was that although the canvas surround was quite effective and made the tanks float, and they had a propeller, a power-driven propeller at the back, worked off the gearbox, which enabled the tank to chug steadily through the water. One of the drawbacks with the Valentine was you had to have the turret reverse when you had the screen up. So in other words, it meant when it landed, the gun was pointing the wrong way, which they could remedy very quickly, but it still wasn't ideal. But it was, it was all that was possible. If they'd have done it any other way, then the gun would foul the screen. As it was, even with the, the turret reversed, they had to have the gun on full elevation to clear the edge of the screen. Otherwise, it wouldn't float, it would sink. So that's one of the things that was odd about the Valentine DD, but it was because it was the frontline tank at the time. It was very much the one for making it into a duplex drive tank, and a lot of them were built by Metro Camel in Birmingham, which was uh, the old metropolitan firm from the First World War, which had built a lot of tanks, and was um, now gradually accumulating other firms like um, camels, the steel makers, and um, expanding at the same time, which wasn't, wasn't to be wondered at, bearing in mind the people who are running it. But that was the sort of the basis of the DD. Now, DD operations were gradually eliminated as far as frontline activity was concerned by the advent of the Sherman which we now used as our main DD tank for invasion and for operations in Italy. And therefore the Valentine was relegated only to training and more often than not on the, the stiller inland waters because they were the tank that men used to uh, initiate the idea of the DD for people to train on and keeping them out of the, the big Shermans which were really designed for action. So um, you find these things being used for training. And one of the incidents that took place, funnily enough, it only took place quite near here, just outside Pool Harbour, was Exercise Smash, which involved six Valentine DDs launching from landing craft and making their way to the beach. Sounds pretty easy. Now, the trouble was that no sooner had the landing craft arrived and put their ramps down to start launching the tanks than the wind got up and the sea got up and they actually found it quite difficult to move in those conditions. In fact, when they got ashore, most of the drivers found that they were up to their waist, at least in water. The water was coming in faster than they could actually chuck it out with the bilge pump. But six tanks sank, and uh, they each one took their drivers with them. The rest of the crew managed to escape, but the drivers in each case were slightly trapped in their sort of front compartment and were all killed. So that six men lost from the front line from 4th, 7th Dragoon Guards in it and lost from the frontline regiments just before D-Day, and they had to think again. But um, that happened, and some of those wrecks were out there, well, for years and years, gradually deteriorating, and as, as a nice home, the conger eels, if you like, that kind of thing. Um, they were the, the real problem, the loss of the, the tanks and the crews, with them, the drivers with them. But Exercise Smash nearly, well, apart from in the regimental history, was nearly forgotten, except that one individual was very concerned about it. The individual was a chap called John Pearson, who at the time was living in Birmingham, and he arranged for a, um, a memorial to these men to be erected near where the tanks had sunk. He actually, if you go up there, there's a thing called Fort Henry on the cliff top at Studland, looking out into the bay. 
And it was designed not as a fort, but really just as a viewing point for people like Churchill and Montgomery to come and see the various practices that were going on. And just beside it is this little stone memorial to the six men of the fourth them who were all drowned in really training for D-Day. So uh, it was quite apt. And it introduces us to John Pierce. Now John, I mean, besides being a friend of the Tank Museum and a man who we have known for years and know very well indeed, was a great one for restoring vehicles. But in the end, is, you could say, um, the scheme got the better of him because what he did, he was found a running hull of a valentine which was for sale in Birmingham and he ended up buying it, which I think cost him a bob or two. But a running hull is a running hull. You still need a turret to make it look like a tank. And as it had been a DD in the first place, he decided to restore it. Well, getting the turret was a problem in itself. He had to buy the turret from abroad. It was brought into this country in pieces, so he had to weld it together. It makes quite a task to recreate the turret and make it look like a tank. And then slowly over the years, he bought all the pieces needed to make a replica DD of it. It has a folding screen uh, on the frame to support it. I don't believe it'll actually float. I think you'll find the screen on it, although it looks the part isn't really waterproof. And it's not a good idea to go swimming in a tank that isn't waterproof. But it's owned by someone who's a friend of the tank museum and who does us proud down again by bringing it down because it's quite a sight to see. And um, that'll be in the arena, we hope, this tank fest. So that's something to look out for. Now, that's covered the exercise smash and John Pearson himself, who he is and uh, what he started to do. We've also got to mention the, uh, the training for D-Day, which these tanks were required for. And one of the main locations for doing this sort of thing was Fritton Decoy in um, East Anglia. Now, it's, a decoy was a place where they put false ducks in to uh, get real ones to come along and be shot if they really wanted to. But uh, now it's known as Fritton Lake. It's in a park and um, it was used as one of the main training centers for all these um, DD tanks. It had launching places. It had inland tank places where men could get inside the hull of a tank and learn the escape routine. They had to learn it in real water, which meant um, breathing from a special apparatus to keep them in fresh air while they rose gently to the surface. And that was um, part of the, the general activity they did there. They did all their initial training, which mainly involved training on the rudder because once the driver had put it into gear, he launched into gear, changed up once, and then made the voyage in that gear. It meant with the tracks going round, the tank was always looking for something to bite on. The driver could tell if the tank was afloat because he had a... Um, there was a device fitted to the front, which you could only see through a periscope, which um, had a bulb on top, which filled with air. And it, it only did so when the tank was actually afloat, when the tracks had left contact with any ground at all. Now it is said that the, um, the thing that contained the air was actually a condom. So uh, I don't know whether it's true or not, but I have heard that a couple of times, that it was a, a sort of tube that leaked air into this balloon-like thing, 
made from a condom which fitted over it, and that was purely there to show the driver that the tank he was in was afloat and not sinking, which is just as well. Um, that, so that was it. Now, the DD tanks generally were, um, they, they built three types, the Mark V Valentine, which had a two pounder gun, the Mark IX, which was a bit of a curiosity in a way, it had a six pounder gun, but it didn't have, because there wasn't room to put one, a coaxial um, machine gun in the turret. So literally the only firepower the tank had was the main six pounder gun, and if he had one, the machine gun on top. That was all he had to rely on, which is why they weren't normally used in action. Once the Sherman had come along, they weren't really needed. So they were only ever used for training. The third one was the Mark 11 Valentine, which had a 75 millimeter gun, which I've already mentioned. So those three were the types produced, built by Metro Camel in Birmingham, and um, used mainly for training with the various regiments that were going to um, adopt DD tanks operationally. They included Canadian and American regiments, all of whom did their basic training on the Valentine. It has a, it's a General Motors engine. It drives a single propeller at the back. Now, the propeller is designed in such a way that it can be folded up. It disappears upwards when it's not in use, so that it's less likely to strike the ground. You only lower it to engage with the drive from the gearbox when you need to, when you need that extra oomph out of it to push it through the water. That's what it's for. But that's the one of the differences between the later one. Now, operationally, these tanks were only used once. They were theoretically kept in reserve for the, for the Sherman when needed. But during the um, Italian campaign, uh, some tanks, DD tanks, were used to cross the river Po. And the next river in line was the Adige. And this was crossed by Sherman DD tanks, plus two, only two, Valentine DDs, which were used to carry spare fuel. They weren't really in action. They didn't fire their guns at all. They just were used to deliver fuel to the Shermans. But that was the nearest that any Valentine ever got to going into action. And that really sums it up, I think. They were the classic training tank, but never used in action apart from that one time. But at least you're going to see one if you come to tank pit.